So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Eric North, who is a professor of practice here at the university for the new regional and community forestry program. And uh, welcome. And if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit about yourself and uh, we'll go from there. <laughs> uh, okay. Well, most of you know me. I am the tree guy on campus. I teach classes in tree care, tree identification, and this uh, talk is going to be about uh, a a UNL study abroad trip that I led with John Carroll, the director of uh, the School of Natural Resources in Botswana. And he brought me along because I'm a tree guy. That didn't actually detract from that, which was nice. Um, absolutely. <laughs> so I uh, helped to bring in some idea about plants. And so we're going to talk about uh, how the, the trip went, what we did, uh, the experience the students had, and then actually review some of the plants and animals. So for the Botswana students that are in the audience, it'll be like, you know, uh, reliving all of June. Um, let's see. Okay, so uh, th for those that don't know, this is where Botswana is. This is where our camp was, um, right here, and uh, yeah, that's, that's it, right? It's kind of the southern part of Africa, so that's the part of the continent that we're looking at. We actually flew into South Africa and stayed at a pretty nice hotel, which was the nicest place that anybody stayed uh, for the next month. It was the one time you could get a really hot, long shower. After that, it was uh, cold and hot showers, not combined, right? We flew into Johannesburg, South Africa, and then drove about six hours on a really nice bus, right? So it was a pretty nice trip up, actually, for the students to get there really pretty comfortable, nice uh, view of the landscape as we went through. Um, we then ended at the Pont Drift Station in South Africa in order to, this is where we crossed the border into Botswana. So we had to do all the passport checks and all that sort of thing. And once we got into Botswana, there were roads. Uh, most people wouldn't recognize them as such. So I took a little video of our first crossing into Botswana. And so this is what it looked like. This is a road. For those of you who don't immediately recognize it as such, um, traffic here happened to be a little bit different than traffic elsewhere, um, but it could still be a little heavy. And I want you to, as you're watching the traffic, pay attention to the feet and the foot movements of these female elephants here and in the background. You'll see something kind of interesting. So what you're seeing there, that kind of picking up of the foot and moving it and swaying it back and forth, this is one of the things that we did while we were in Africa. We worked with the guides of eco-training to basically help us identify signs and signals so that we knew how to act and behave around the wildlife that was there, because this is a completely open reserve with no fences, and these are truly wild animals. And that movement of the foot of elephants that you saw both on these two uh, female elephants, um, that's essentially a sign of sort of nervousness. They're uncertain exactly what's happening, and we're sitting there in a large vehicle, completely stopped, trying to be very quiet so that we don't disrupt anything that they're doing. But the students eventually threw out, probably nobody noticed this, this is our first night in, noticed this, but we learned to recognize these signals so you could be safe and uh, make sure that you were paying attention to things that were happening around you. Uh, once we got into, uh, this, this is actually the very opening of the camp here. You see this, this is an elephant skull that was around, right? So you were greeted by this every time you walked in. And these are people basically helping us into camp. This is what the camp looked like. The picnic tables around here. It's where we uh, left our gear while we kind of explored around. First thing people asked when we got back is, did there bathrooms there? Were there bathrooms? Yes, there were bathrooms. It was an actual flush toilet. Yes, I took this photo. Um, I don't usually take photos of toilets, but every once in a while. Um, we had places to basically brush our teeth, clean up. There were showers. This is what it looked like. You either got an ice cold shower or a steaming piping hot shower. There was none of this lukewarm showers that you get at your house where it's comfortable, right? It was hot or very cold. Um, so showers were brief, um, but it was at least nice to be able to clean up. Uh, this is what the paths look like as we kind of walked around. So you can see they actually kept the paths nice and groomed, but it's not, you know, it's not paved. It's not anything like that. And so frequently we walk up, wake up in the morning, you'd see animal droppings or footprints as you'd kind of walk through these paths. Um, there's also no electricity at this site except for a little bit of a generator. 
And so everything was either generator powered, a little bit of solar power, but that means that at night it was whatever the ambient light out was. So if it was a moonlit night or starlit night, that's what you saw. Uh, here's a tent you can see. This is that's actually my tent. You can see one of the students back here. That's Kayla. She was actually walking to her tent. She's not just kind of rambling around back there. So this is what that looked like. These are what the tents actually look like. So actually pretty comfortable. I could stand up. I'm not that tall, but I could stand up completely on the inside of that tent. So it's about six foot at the peak, right? So pretty comfortable actually to get in there and change the bed on the inside. It was this is the this was not my first time camping. I've done a lot of backpacking, and I'm used to sleeping on the ground. And I thought, oh kind of old to sleep on the ground for an entire month. And then I saw that there was a nice mattress and I thought, it'll be good. It'll be good. There's a flush toilet and a mattress. What more could a guy want? You know what I mean? Right? Um, these are the women that basically helped us out. They cooked all of our meals. They cleaned up after everything and they were fantastic. They were also pretty entrepreneurial. They would go into town and buy chocolate and then sell it back to the students at a slight markup, <laughs> which was fantastic. Really great. They, they were Fun, uh, fun ladies to work with. These that they have here, and I'll talk about this a little bit later, these are baskets that they actually bring in from one of the villages and they sell, and so uh, students could purchase them and see them, and we actually visited the basket, uh, the place where these baskets are made, and I'll talk about that as we go. Uh, these are some of our guides. This is Shaba or Shabalala. Uh, he's actually native to Botswana, grew up in a village pretty near there, and he was great at pointing out all sorts of things, and he would constantly go going back into town and making sure our vehicles worked and really did a great job. We also, students were like, hey, can you pick up more chocolate in town or something else as he would go in, so he was great. Uh, this is Yannick, so Yannick is actually, uh, he's an American that was there. Uh, he's a photographer, very good photographer, does a lot of wildlife shoots, and he was there basically training to be an eco-guide, to, to guide in these, um, uh, for eco-tourism. Uh, great. This is Jane. Jane is from Yorkshire, England. And as John would say, she was all Yorkshire, 100% Yorkshire. Um, uh, she was great. Jane did a lot of work in lion conservation and, and really helped us get to understand the individual lions that, that were named and they had books. They basically had their own Facebook profiles, but here it was actually printed out bases on books, not online, right? Um, so Jane was great to work with. We have Laz. This, this is pretty typical of Laz. He brought a lot of levity to camp and was very, very knowledgeable. Laz is actually from Botswana as well, owns a farm there. Really a great, uh, he's got a lot of guiding experience for various companies. Uh, he actually has guided for REI, for those of you that know the outdoor recreation company. He's done some of their South African trips. Really uh, very, very experienced. And sort of love to punish the students on occasion by making them walk incredibly fast early in the morning and up hills and taking the most difficult and longest route we could possibly take to get to a place. I loved it because I love to walk. The students often looked a little more tired, right? Uh, so here we have Nicola. Nicola was from New Zealand but had also spent some time teaching in England. And so she basically started doing these uh, tours and then got out of teaching entirely and now teaches in a, in a different way. Right? She teaches how to pe people how to actually do these, these guiding systems and was a great resource. And next to her is Okwa. Okwa, I'll talk about a little bit more, but he is also from Botswana and he helped design a lot of the guiding uh, uh, protocols that are actually used in Botswana. And he's got some interesting stories uh, of his whole life. In fact, he was here this last April and for those that got to see him, it was, he's fantastic. Um, and this was Matt. Uh, Everybody liked Matt. Matt was actually the same age as most of our students. Matt's about 20 years old, South African, uh, but he'd been guiding for something, I think, since he was 15 or 16 years old, and this is his chosen profession. So he essentially finished the equivalent of high school and then went right into guiding as a professional guide, and Matt was incredibly knowledgeable, very friendly, great sense of humor. We, we loved working with, with all of the guides, actually, but this kind of gives you a flavor. We were dealing with people from around the world, even at this camp, which was a lot of fun and part of the experience. Uh, the last person here, this is Adrian and me without a beard, which was a shock to everybody uh, at one point. Um, sorry if it's bringing back bad memories for the students. Uh, Adrian was great. His, his nickname for me, he would just look at me and say, oh, botanist, right? Because every time I came across a plant like this one, I was like, what is this? What, what is this plant? What looks to you like a bundle of sticks is actually called uh, leafless wormwood. Okay, it's a bush. It's photosynthetic, no leaves, but it basically looks like pickup sticks for those of you that are old enough to know what pickup sticks are. Uh, we, we looked at the common string of stars. So every single little plant that I would look at, I would get kind of excited about. 
which I think was unique uh, personality for this particular thing. Most people get excited about the animals. I'm like, yeah, yeah, elephant. But what is this tiny little plant, right? Um, here we have lavender croton, which is fantastic, right? You're at a hot hike and you kind of, you don't smell great because the showers are minimal, right? Lavender croton is something you can kind of rub together, smell just like lavender. It ended up in more than one pair of my socks, right? Really helpful. But Adrian was great. And he, if he didn't know something, he would come over and we'd spend uh, 20 minutes, half hour pouring through uh, botany books, looking at different plants and things. So it was a great experience. This is another picture of Oakland. For those of you that saw the first talk I did on Botswana, you've seen this picture. But this is kind of to remind me that it was really cool having guides from all over the place, but you could definitely tell the guides that were born and raised in Botswana. Where the guides from South Africa, even in uh, England and the US, were very, very good and very competent. We were never felt uncomfortable with them. They'd sometimes get a little spooked by something, and all you had to do was look over at Okwa. And if Okwa was sitting there like, yeah, it's fine, you knew it was all okay, right? Because Okwa really could just, part of being born in that area and, and growing up in that, he, you looked for him, and if he got freaked out, you said, okay, it, it's, we really need to be much more careful. And he never actually got freaked out the whole time we were there. So we had no negative encounters, really. Um, it was it was great, but this is kind of an iconic picture of, of Okwa. You'd see him like this, just standing kind of guard over all of us. Uh, so our first night in camp. So I hopefully this works. I have some sound on this next thing. It's a moonless night. We just got in. Some students had never been off the continent before, um, and most had never been camping before, and this is the first thing that happened. It's pitch black. I'm trying to stare out my window of my tent, right? My tent, there's the window. That's what I see looking back at me outside the window of my tent by the glow of the moonlight. Elephants had roamed through and that sound that you heard is them right outside. And that's actually about spatially right for how far away he was from my tent, right? So I would say about two to three feet. And that was just the tearing of them eating, right? Really kind of peaceful until you look up and you're like, that's a rather large animal who stopped and looked directly at me. And I thought, we should come to, to an understanding that I will do whatever you want. Right? <laughs> um, but really, really cool first experience. John and I, I know, were both sitting there thinking, I hope nobody is screaming. Please nobody scream, right? And so the students were great. And they all, really, the next morning, it was all kind of talking about the elephants that were in camp, right, the night before. So it was pretty cool. Uh, we also saw other animals. We saw the crested barbet, right? I'm not a bird guy so much, but I did get to learn some birds there. Lots of birds in Botswana. This particular one's name was Croton, who loved to eat anything we left after breakfast, right? We saw warthogs. To give you an idea of how close the warthogs were in camp, this is, right, where the arrow is pointing where our bags were. That was right behind is right where those warthogs were. There's a little watering hole there. And you have to be really quiet around warthogs because when you find them, essentially, they will run away from you if they sense any disturbance. And their little tail is shot up like a little bumper car, right? And they run off into the distance. Uh, kind of cool. We learned from Laz, right? As we were walking around, we'd see these little burrows here. And he always pushed us off to the side. He said, warthogs back into their burrows so that if they get freaked out or disturbed, they will come charging out. And if you've ever seen the tusks of a warthog, you can see that these things are quite large, right? This would be very painful to be run over by um, as the warthog chugs off into the, into the distance, right? Uh, so we did see bones of animals, right? This is a natural reserve. So we saw things and we'd pick things up, but everything was left in place, right? So we'd look at stuff, examine, take photos, right? Uh, morning started early, 5.45 for the students. John and I were usually up at 4 a.m. having coffee, tea. Um, and kind of waiting for the students. And then after the, they'd get their first breakfast, they'd go out and ride. So we had two of these Land Rovers, which was pretty cool, one covered, one uncovered. Students would all pile in, and we'd drive around looking for things, and when we saw stuff, the students would all turn and look at it, right? <laughs> because it was pretty cool, especially the first few days, right? The first couple of weeks, everything was brand new. And after that, we started doing some other things where students got a little more experience actually uh, 
using some conservation skills, some land management skills, things like that. The other thing we did, so we actually had 18 students with us, which is a lot for this trip. And so those vehicles each held nine, but we filled them with six each. So we'd have three groups. I usually went out with the walking group and then we'd just walk around. We'd walk around, there were two guides that would lead us. You can see Yannick there with his rifle. That's a 50 caliber rifle. Essentially, there were two rifles that would walk around in front of us and we walked in a single file line. Um, if they told us to do anything, we just did it, right? Because they were the ones there keeping us safe. What they would do is as we'd walk around, they'd stop and they'd point at something. And sometimes, at least initially, we'd go, what are you pointing at? It's just a pile of poop, right? Why are we looking at that? And we learned to read the signs, essentially, of this particular landscape. So it was very good. And the guides, there are always two um, guides, Okwa and then um, one of the other trainees, usually, or something like that, would always be there to back up. And then I was always in the back because John told me it was easier to fill out the paperwork if I got taken out by an elephant than if one of the students did. So, uh, but we all made it back, right? We went anywhere on foot. On foot, we could kind of go wherever we wanted, so we did. And this was probably, actually, yeah, that's Laz in the front. He's like, oh, there's an easier path. Let's go this way, right? So we'd go the hardest possible way. But this is the landscape that we were out looking over, right? This is an incredible landscape. So when you first see this, you're like, oh, the elephants. I look at it and see, oh, look, there's large leaf mustard bush in there. Holy cow. Oh, my goodness. Do you see there's some umbrella thorn? Whoa. And off in the distance there, I see a leadwood. Man, what a le Oh, elephants. Cool. Right? Leacop. And leacop, right, which you're not supposed to point at, so I don't even want to point. Right? Leacop is basically uh, a, kind of a sacred site there. In fact, you're not allowed to go to the top of leacop unless you're a chief of one of the tribes. And so we basically were able to view it, but you're not supposed to point at it at all. And so people would just sort of nod and talk about it and its historical relevance, right? But this is the landscape that we were driving through and walking through. It was really a fantastic uh, way to spend a day, actually, or a month. At night, oftentimes we'd, you know, it's winter there, and so we'd sort of talk about, oh, okay, let's, it's getting dark, so we need to head back. But we'd always head up, even on the walks, and we'd do a sunset. And somebody at one point asked John, do you ever get tired of the sunsets? I mean, John's been going here for 20 plus years. And I believe even he said, nope, you never do. All right? And this is what the sunset looked like most every night. Really fantastic. Fantastic way to wind down the day. Uh, we saw lots of cool things like iconic trees. This is the baobab. This happens to be the first time we walked past a baobab, which I got very excited about and maybe made them stop and pull over even though we we're just walking, but we had to get a little closer. We had to go up to it. I had to touch the baobab. Um, it was a good time, right? Um, we saw other iconic wildlife. I was, uh, was hoping Calvin would be here. Uh, Calvin, uh, we, we assigned that each student had to look up various birds. This is the Cory Bustard. Um, it's an iconic bird, but Calvin was complaining because he didn't think this was a particularly iconic bird, even though it's the national bird of Botswana, which is iconic in and of itself. And it's the heaviest of flying birds at about 42 pounds right? That's kind of crazy to think about. Uh, so we did see Cory Bustards while we were there. It's great. Uh, we saw Steenbuck. In fact, this is part of the conservation training. We, they did Steenbuck surveys where they drive out along a particular road and then they count how many Steenbuck in the distance to because in order to manage and, and actually even do ecotourism, you need to know where stuff is. And if you know one route has more of an animal than another route, that might be the route you go to for tourists that are really interested. And so having some idea of where your population moves and how they move and how much is there is really quite important. We saw black-backed jackals, which are cool. These are uh, both nocturnal and um, diurnal, so you'd see them during the day, and so that's primarily when we saw them, although we would do night drives and we'd see them as well. So they were pretty cool um, to kind of look at and find. The students learn basic tracking skills. So Nicola is the one that's bent down on her knee there and she's pointing out tracks. Part of the reason that uh, tracking is interesting, not just to be able to find, it, like to track an animal to see if you can find it, but because sometimes you never see the animal. So we never saw the aardvark, right? The earth pig. Um, they're nocturnal, but we would see their fresh tracks on a regular basis. And we'd see other markings of them. We'd see them near termite mounds because they eat the termites. The termites here, so this is a, a system that everything is interrelated and we taught things as though everything is, is, we taught things to the students because it's all interrelated. This particular termite mound is interrelated with a fungus. So the termites themselves gather the wood and then they bring it in and then they feed the fungus, the fungus breaks it down, termites get the food source, they build these huge mounds, okay? 
These would be five to six feet, four to maybe four to six feet tall, but underneath the size when they've excavated or looked at some of these, they can be the size of a football field underground. And these can last for decades. In fact, when we were told, John and I both had cell phones, and so we could make phone calls, use the internet on occasion, the students were not allowed to. We were told the best place to get signal is by the termite mound to the northeast of camp. So you'd go stand on a termite mound uh, and say, hey, how's it going? Right? I'm calling you from the termite mound in Mashatu. Um, the weather's nice here. Uh, the stinky shepherd's tree, or as I like to call it, the Kyle tree. Uh, Kyle is here. Kyle lost my clinometer. There's now a baboon that's got a really expensive clinometer that he's playing with. And so <laughs> Kyle got the stinky shepherd's tree. But at the base of this, so as we'd walk around, we'd find trees like this, right? And we'd learn a little about, about the ecology. This one is a twofer. At the base here, we actually see the starting of a lollipop. And I'll talk more about the lollipop as, as we go, All right? Uh, sometimes, so initially, I think, I, I hope this happened with most of the students. They're like, oh, kudu. And I went, oh, look at these other things, wild sage and uh, Lucium schizocalyx, right? So you could start to see the way that animals would use certain types of vegetation for camouflage or that they would prefer to eat certain types of vegetation. And so starting to realize that even in these wildlife conservation, conserving of the plant life is as important as conserving of the wildlife, right? In fact, I, I was trying to convince people that plants are indeed life and are wild. So they are also wildlife. So wildlife conservation basically covers everything, right? Um, and it's important to know as much about these systems as you can. Uh, scat identification. So for those that don't know, scat is poop, right? So we spent a lot of time. I have handled more scat now than I ever thought I would. Um, Yep, that's right. You pick it up, you break it apart, uh, especially if it's basically an, an herbivore. It's fairly safe to do. You still wash your hands, obviously, uh, but you can break it apart and you can see what they're eating, where they've been, how old it's, how long it's been there based on the decomp levels, based on the heat sometimes. Fresh elephant poop, for instance, is really warm where, and I know this for a fact, right? We got to handle all sorts of stuff. So a lot of fun. Yep. Stick your finger in. It's done, right? Uh, students also, I think a lot of them and several have now admitted to me that when they first heard and when I gave the first lecture before we went about trees, they're like, who's this tree guy? Why are we talking about trees? I don't want to know about this. But they all learned to basically love trees by the time we left. All right? This happens to be leadwood, which has a lot of cultural significance. This is a tree that has really hard wood and it's also fairly decay resistant. So when they do die, these standing trees tend to last on the landscape for a long time. And it's become sort of a cultural thing to believe that the ancestors are sort of contained within these trees, that they have some ancestral importance. Okay? There's also some other cool stuff that if you were to burn a little bit of this, you could take the wood ash and actually use it as a toothpaste, which is pretty cool. Um, but a very fascinating tree. These were used for all sorts of things. In fact, you'd still see old fence posts that were made out of leadwood because of their decay resistance. Right? Uh, that we got to see the hyrex. The coolest fact about the hyrex that everybody loves to say is that this is actually related to the elephant. How cool is that? Um, it doesn't uh, regulate its temperature particularly well, so we mostly saw them sunning like you would see lizards or reptiles. And we, uh, the other thing you can see, you can't see from this picture, but you can from here, this is a hyrex skull. There are its tusks, right? little tusks. Um, so far, there's not a big trade in hyrex tusks, which is good. Uh, we saw a zebra, pretty cool. Can't go to Africa without seeing a zebra, I think. Right? Um, so we saw ostriches. So Botswana, home to two of record-breaking birds, the heaviest bird that flies and the heaviest bird that does not fly. right? Actually, just the heaviest of birds, so over 300 pounds, but really magnificent to sort of see them strutting around in the landscape and, and kind of see them just, you're just driving around, you're just walking, and there goes an ostrich. You're like, huh, that's pretty cool, right? Saw so spotted hyenas, aw, right? Little baby spotted hyenas, how cute. Look, here's another one. He's hiding behind, you can tell this is a Mopani, so that's why I took this picture. Um, but there happened to be a hyena in it, which is nice. And everybody looks at this like, oh, so cute. Uh, okay, it's bite strength is over 1,100 pounds of force per square inch. To give you some idea, you as an adult human have a bite strength of around 110 pounds uh, of force per square inch. Uh, this is less cuddly at this point. This is a very dangerous animal, right? They can actually break through and eat bones. This is not a picture of bones. This is a picture of hyena poop, which is white. When they eat the bones, they actually get the calcium out of it. The, the, other animals then come seek out the hyena poop because it has calcium, which is a valuable mineral. 
And so this actually doesn't just go to waste and decay and feed plants, right? It feeds other animals, actually, because of the calcium component. So you see how all these systems are tied together, right? Very interesting. Um, we see the cheetah, reportedly the fastest land animal. Here, there's a close-up of the cheetah. Look at that. We watched it. It sat up, and then it laid back down. It did neither of these things quickly. I've only seen a cheetah run once. It was running away from a lion. That was in Kenya. Uh, we actually only saw it kind of sit up and lay back down very slowly. Kind of lazy, right? A lot of the cats, especially during the day, pretty lazy. Uh, we saw the Mashatu tree. We had one of these in camp. Really amazing tree. If you're in South Africa, it's called the Nalala tree. But in Mashatu, you refer to this as the Mashatu tree. Uh, Xanthrosersis zambesiaca. I just like saying that name. It's pretty cool. The fruit on this is used by uh, both humans and uh, other animals. In fact, in our camp, it was used by vervet monkeys, mostly to eat and then throw at us um, and then occasionally poop on us. Um, that did happen. It's a great shade tree. You could occasionally see primates in herbivore groups, right? So here, leopards. So this is a leopard that we actually drove up on. Um, they would sometimes hang their prey in trees. Right, drag them up there, eat their prey. And so sometimes you'd just drive around and you'd see bones. And right? I don't think anybody in our group saw this, but you can find pictures of this. We'd just, you see a carcass and it looks like the you know, antelope jumped into the tree and died, but it's actually probably a leopard. Um, you'll notice that this particular leopard is staring rather ominously. If you look closely, you can see a little squirrel tail. This is one of the other signs we learned to read, okay? If you look here, you see this, this little, the squirrel was alarm calling you got really sensitive to the fact that other animals would alarm call and alert you to something that you should be paying closer attention to that you couldn't see because maybe they're up in a tree and they have a greater view, right? And so we actually got to learn like, uh oh, something is alarm calling. Are they alarm calling at us because we're walking by? Or are they alarm calling at something else? And so by the end of the trip, you could really start to sense people were paying more and more attention to things like the elephant foot and to the alarm call that you would see. Right, uh, primates in trees. Right here, are a couple of students, uh, natural resource majors. Right, equal students in trees. So this is one of the Mashatu trees that we took a break by. Right, these students were climbing everything, and then they also brought several people brought hammocks, and this is just in camp, so they would take naps uh, on occasion as we got back from field activities. Right, but really kind of cool to see that. So this tree, this is a Mashatu tree. And this is a particularly special Mashatu tree for one reason, only one reason. We were nearing, this is the beginning of the last week of camp, and we're walking by this tree with Okwa and a couple other guides. And so one of our last kind of walks that we're going to be out, each group is going through the last walk. And Kyle stops at this tree, and he turns to me, and he goes, this is my favorite tree. And I said, oh, you love Mashatu? He's like, no, this exact tree is my favorite tree. And so um, I couldn't help but be sort of touched by that, right? Kyle was, um, even though he lost my clinometer, we made up, it's all good now. Um, but it's pretty cool to have a student come out and say, this, this one tree, this is my favorite, right? Pretty interesting impact. We saw lots of Impala. Um, <laughs> there were lots of fun Impala games that we came up with because you, Impala are like white-tailed deer. Um, you can ask the students how they referred to Impala. I don't think I can say that. Um, but we came up with lots of name that Impala movie title. I mean, because you saw these things everywhere. So it was a lot of fun um, to kind of go. We were there at the beginning of uh, sort of breeding season. So they were rutting. And so you saw or heard the Impala constantly snorting at each other all night long. It was a little annoying the first week, actually. And then every time you'd see two males, you'd see them clashing. And you got to watch these interactions. We also learned how to track impala. Not that you really needed their footprints that much. You could usually just look off in the distance and say, yeah, they're over there, right? Or you could hear them, especially the first couple of weeks. But we did learn how to identify uh, the tracks of the impala. And we learned that ecologically, their impala middens, which is where they tend to poop in a big pile, right? And we learned that that actually becomes a social uh, territory, not just for impala, but for other animals. So if you kind of notice, you see other, other scat that's mixed in between there. So this became sort of a ground where you could track what animals were in the area. It's really interesting. And as with everything in this particular territory, nothing goes to waste, right? This is um, from actually a dung beetle. It's a, a telecorporid, which means they roll up dung. And then their young go on the inside and they break out. So we saw other types of dung beetle as we were going. But anywhere you'd go, you could look closely at a pile like this that you might typically have walked past and see the ecology of the system that's happening there.
which is really, really sort of fascinating. You get kind of excited. We, but, oh, look, another, another dung beetle, another something, right? Regardless of what it was. The Mopani, right? Great tree. Sometimes, uh, I talked about this more in my first talk, but this is sometimes referred to as the organ tree because the leaves look sort of like lungs. The seed looks like a kidney. If you crack the seed open, it looks like a little brain on the inside. But I also think that this happens to look like a little butterfly. Right? Um, here's what the Mopani where we were at looked like. If you saw these on a hillside, they were full standing trees. Right? Really interesting. So the ecology of this particular area it tells us why the Mopani are formed like this. Leaves high in protein, heavily browsed, right? mostly by elephants and giraffes. Um, really interesting. So what we would see are herds of elephants like this. And we'd see them come through, and even the baby elephants, right, eating the Mopani. And so this kind of brings into concepts other things in wildlife conservation. How do you favor a species? What do you look at? This particular species, the elephants, as well as the termites, are keystone species here in this system, right? They form and change the landscape based on their browse levels. They're the ones that are keeping these trees as a shrubland as opposed to taller upright trees, right? Very interesting. Uh, elephant poop, obviously this is fairly fresh. I can tell you that for a fact. Uh, it was still warm. Uh, you can also notice this orange which if you were hungry enough, totally edible, didn't even break the skin. That was an orange an elephant had eaten, I use that term loosely because it basically pulled it off a tree, put it in its mouth, and then it just came out the other end as an orange. Um, slightly processed, right? Maybe a little squished for juice, but there was a citrus farm nearby. And so this tells us a couple of things about elephants. They like to eat lots of things, and they don't digest stuff particularly well. Right? And so their dung ends up as being a really great habitat, food source, a way to spread seeds, right? They're obviously not uh, digesting fully or, or destroying seeds. And so really an interesting way that elephants kind of uh, work in these systems. Right? Yeah, that's the orange there. Um, elephants also make these big, uh, basically what look like watering holes, but big mud puddles. This isn't actually a watering hole. This is a wallowing hole where elephants can go and get cooled off. So they'll stomp around in the area. We actually got a little bit of rain, which is why this one is filled with water. This is an experiential system for students who are learning abroad. So we're like, hey, get in and feel the mud. The students got in and felt the mud. And then they, we said, oh, you know, elephants will put mud on themselves. So some students put mud on themselves. Then they put mud on other people by throwing mud at them. And they ended up like this. Uh, it was a great muddy mess, but a lot of fun. Even the guides got in on sort of... Uh, yeah, throwing mud at each other, essentially. But it was a lot of fun, and it was a hot day, so it was a great way to sort of cool down and sort of experience and see what this was like. But this was a good opportunity for Laz to say, elephants don't drink out of that, right? That water is usually not particularly good, and elephants are intelligent animals, and they don't drink out of that. This is how they drink. This is the Mudlutsi River, just outside. Our camp was right up against this. This is a river. It is a dry river, or so it appears. Surface level, it is dry. Okay. Uh, Botswana has a very distinct rainy season and a very distinct dry season. We were there in winter, which is their dry season. Here, the elephant is actually digging down about 18 inches with its trunk, and then it's actually pulling up water. And you could sit and just watch the elephant drink water for about 10 or 15 minutes in these systems. The students got a chance at one point to actually go into the riverbed and dig a giant hole and then watch it slowly fill up with water. So it was fresh water, basically just subsurface flow in this particular system. And this is, so you'd see elephants doing this constantly throughout. They didn't use these mud puddles that were all, you know, uh, gunky. You wouldn't want to drink out of it, neither do the elephants, right? So really interesting. The baobabs, right? One of my personal favorites. This is one of the first ones I think this group measured. And so this is, again, thinking about how elephants impact and how wildlife can impact a particular system. Um, you can see there's a two, four, six, seven of us across there. We could have got at least one or two more people. So these things are massive, massive trees, right? Actually more of a succulent than an actual tree, depending upon the literature that you're reading. Um, so they tend to pick up lots of water and store it in their trunks. Um, however, they happen to be favorites of elephants. So one of the things that we wanted to do was thinking about if you're guiding people, and you want to show them where the elephants are, you should maybe know where some of the vegetation is, but what if you also want to show them iconic trees like the baobabs? You should know where those are, 
right? So we should be able to understand where that resource is. And given that this is the impact that elephants can have on the baobabs, you might want to understand how the population of baobabs is actually functioning, right? So this is a big chunk out of this. Now, baobabs have amazing ability to respond. And so we actually saw some of these that had enormous holes that were kind of growing new tissue over it. Uh, some of these baobabs have actually been turned into like jail cells, uh, bars, uh, things like that. Uh, not so much the ones in Africa, but elsewhere. So the baobab genus is actually pretty resilient. But this brings into question uh, things about carrying capacity of a particular landscape and which animals and which plant species you want to conserve for and how you go about. It's not easy. It's very, very difficult situations, right? Um, we got to measure a bunch of stuff though, so a lot of fun here on the left. Elena is actually measuring. I looked around for those of you that are foresters. We use D tapes, diameter tapes. I didn't have any that were big enough. Couldn't find buy any that were quite big enough for these, right? Pretty massive. So we just use a hundred foot piece of uh, paracord essentially, and then we measured it out on the ground. And Mason here, uh, she's going to yell at me after this, I'm sure, for this picture. But this was Mason using the clinometer, which is a tool. If you haven't used it, is actually how you can measure height, gauge height. So we actually train students not only to measure things, but how to measure it and then how to track and what these things actually meant. All right, so they came out with some usable skills in terms of plant uh, identification and measurement. Um, and so this is one of the alleys that we actually went through. This is Baobab Alley. And you can just see kind of a nice line of Baobabs and it went down. Um, so it was really cool to kind of go through this. We then ended up mapping this entire system on the part of reserve that we were on. So we measured and mapped around 70 baobabs, really as a conservation teaching tool and as a way to talk about um, ecological, not only um, training, but conservation, right? And ecological tourism. I happen to believe that in, in my first talk, Botswana, I talked about the botanical big five, right? That we could really highlight some of these iconic trees and conserve areas and bring tourists just to see trees. I mean, I would totally go on that trip. I don't know how many other people would, but I would go, right? Um, so we occasionally also did night drives. So night drives, the purpose was to be able to try and find animals that were more active at night. We did this by baiting them with a student on the front of the car. Okay. This is the tracker seat. So these, these, one of the vehicles was equipped with a tracker seat, essentially so you could ride in the front and you could look down and see tracks as you're driving and you could tell the driver to slow down because you see something. You could change directions or stop and look for other signs, right? Uh, the first night that we did this, um, this is what we saw, a lion. Always sitting in the middle of the road, right? Um, and so we stopped. There were two vehicles there that night. I think Kyle, you were in the front seat. Yeah, Kyle was the one that we had baited the lions with. Um, so you could see them just sort of sitting there and we stopped, right? The lion was like, you're shining a bright light in my eyes. So kind of got up, walked past the second vehicle, pretty close, but we were able to sort of keep them at bay using lights and, and the guides were there with us as well. And then the lion just sort of got bored with us and walked off into the pitch black and you couldn't see very far. And all you could hear was a growl and a rumble. And it sort of hit you right in your chest. You could just feel this really visceral moment of a lion that close to you making really uh, sort of primal sounds. But it was a very cool experience to be able to see stuff that close up. Uh, this is another encounter we had with this particular lion. This was Alby. This was one that had been named and was being tracked by Jane. Uh, tracked in terms of every time there was a sighting, she would record the sighting and record uh, where it was at and what it was doing, right? So this is really funny. Laz is the one that's driving. You can see his hat there, and I'm sitting right next to him here taking the picture. And both of us were kind of looking out, and he's like, oh, lion tracks. And I said, oh, cool, yeah, I see some on this side too. And I, I was still looking down. I said, how, uh, how fresh do you think these are? He looks at me. He just kind of says, very fresh, 15 seconds. And then I looked up, and I realized he's, of course, staring at the lion. Uh, so we turned the corner. This is on the way back to camp. Um, and we turned the corner and Albie was very nicely just sitting there kind of off the side of the road. So we got a lot of photo ops that we could do, kind of take pictures from the safety of the vehicles. So look at this uh, magnificent animal until um, usually the way it goes with eco training and ecotourism, your job is to disturb the animals and the landscape as little as you possibly can. And so a lot of times what you would do is just sit. And if you had to go buy the animal, you would just wait until they picked up and moved on, right? So as not to disturb them. So we waited till Albie kind of trotted off 
uh, in, in another direction, right? But really, really amazing to be able to be that close. Uh, this is the other sighting we had of Albi. Um, so essentially, John uh, went out and, and it was standing, this was after our morning activity, so kind of mid-morning, stands out in the riverbed and is kind of basking in the beauty of the morning and then looks over and goes, there are a lot of lions over there. I should go back to camp. <laughs> and so then walked calmly back to camp, which is what you do, right? Only things that are edible run. And so if you don't want to be eaten, you walk slowly and calmly. So John walked slowly and calmly and then came up into camp and said, uh, okay, everybody, there's a lion. Everybody sort of be quiet, be still, get inside this little tent area. So this tent area off here, this is where we had breakfast and lectures and things. This is our fire pit. LB was essentially right just outside of this area. So kind of followed right into camp there. I was standing inside the sort of tent area and we're just kind of all watching. And as students would kind of come down uh, from either napping or, or to look at other things, we'd say, there's a lion, be really quiet. And everybody's busy. So it becomes very, very quiet. And then somebody's camera, this was one of the other students' camera was sitting there. So I just picked it up and started taking pictures, right? Because what an amazing experience. Right. So we did have lions in camp, we had hyenas in camp, elephants, monkeys, warthogs, right, genets, all sorts of amazing things. Right? Uh, if this had happened the first night, this probably would have worried us all a little bit more, but this happened, I think, week two or three in. And so people were pretty much always on guard and always paying attention and really uh, respectful of the environment that they were in. Right? What an amazing thing. Kudu, we saw lots of kudu. Every time we saw a kudu, one of the students who may or may not be sitting here right now would do a little kudu song. That was great. Uh, this is a female kudu. Uh, this is a male kudu. Their horns can grow up to 72 inches. That's, a, that's huge. These are massive animals, obviously, really impressive to see. This kudu is also standing by a large leaf fever berry, for those of you that were more interested in the tree. Um, uh, so really cool. But one of the things that the kudu horn, it's actually a layer of uh, tissue out uh, over top of the actual horn itself, the bony part. And so that comes off. And when that comes off, when a kudu is dead, um, the, basically people would take that and they would make a, a kudu horn out of it. So you could blow into it for various reasons, ceremonies, things like that. And so what we were uh, fortunate enough to see, this is nature, right? So nature, uh, things get killed in nature. And so we saw lions that both killed a kudu and we, this was one that had actually killed a warthog, but there, we got to actually watch them feeding. We didn't see the kills directly, but got to watch them feeding. We watched them feed on a kudu um, for a few days. And then once that kudu had been sort of stripped clean by the lions, then the jackals came in and other things came in and that was left with basically just bones and the horns. So a couple of our guides uh, picked up one of the kudu horns and brought it back and they kind of washed it out, cleaned it out and made it into the actual horn uh, for blowing, which then the students all got a chance to uh, use. So I'm going to, there's a little video here. So Yannick is the American, Matt is the South African. It still smells of death. <laughs> So you can see people kind of turning away when you put your lips on it. This came off a dead animal, right? So this is not the best smelling of things. And if you kind of inhaled, if you do like, I'm going to take a breath, it was not good, right? And if you were actually standing at the end of it, as somebody blows into it, it also was not particularly pleasant. Uh, but really kind of a fun experience to see that, right, and to see what that was like. Um, the, the northern lollipalm, so this is the way we saw them mostly in the landscape just coming out of the ground. This is actually what they would look like in sort of full, so full palm tree that I think most people sort of recognize. This is the particular one. The sap is used to make wine, 
which John told everybody, if anybody offers you that wine, do not drink it. <laughs> it's uh, made in some dubious ways sometimes. Um, the fruit takes a couple of years to ripen, and basically um, the way that the uh, people would use this is more, for, so also the wine and the sap and the fruits, but also they would take the palm fronds and make them into baskets that I talked about earlier. So here, this is the basket. Uh, this is a group in a town called Matabane, uh, which is nearby, which we went and visited at one point. Um, and the name, I, I can't pronounce the name basket company, but the name translate, Adrian told me, to the sun is coming, which basically means something. This is the literal translation, but the sort of feeling behind it is it's all good, right? Things are, things are good. And so this basket was, company was made up of a cooperative of women from the community that really take this sort of traditional way of making these baskets really, really great. Um, so here I kind of highlight out, so they essentially strip off the individual fronds, they then put them in a pot of essentially boiling water to get them prepped, right? To get them prepped and to actually dye them a little bit so they have a couple of different colors that they can use. Uh, they then take individual pieces, right, and wrap these around. These women were really amazing to just watch because they would talk to you while they're just sort of, you know, working with their fingers and hands and really incredible. And so you can sort of see uh, what this looks like. They'd sort of start to round things out. And I think it took up to a couple of days or so to make an individual basket. Uh, so really a lot of work that went into these. You can see just as they're starting, this would have been the bottom portion of a basket. So this the intricate weaving of this. I have a couple of these. Most of the students, I think, bought a basket or bought one of the products basically to take back, which the village loved because they use this for income, right? So really nice. Um, this woman here, so the, here's, a, here's the inside of their shop. And this woman actually made some baskets that John bought and brought back to uh, Lincoln. And so they should be, are they at now? Yeah, so good. So they, they will be at the, the, the African Museum here in Lincoln. So you can actually go see that with photos and a little bit of history of the people that actually make them, right? So really, really uh, fascinating the way people use plants that are in, in their environment and the things that communities do in order to sort of give back culturally to what's happening. And great experience, I think, for the students. Uh, we learned some survival skills. Uh, near the end of camp, so students were like, okay, so you're lost in the bush, and you need to make fire, and you need to find water. You need to be able to do these things. It was great to see a bunch of students playing with poop and trying to start it on fire, right? Some students that had never been camping before, had never really been out of a city much before, to see them just all of a sudden embrace this idea, right? And see who could light it. This one I caught Mason. Actually, the, the point at which flame started right, in grasses, right, so that's pretty cool, um, and to see people happy as this, to walk around with flaming, this was elephant dung, actually, and when you light it on fire, smelling elephant dung is supposed to help medic medicinally with, like, headaches and things like that, and it actually, it doesn't smell bad, it smells, it smells pretty good, uh, strangely, so, and to see, I mean, just to watch students to kind of play with poop and start things on fire, it was a lot of fun. Um, they also tried to learn how to do the, the stick, so rubbing together of the stick and basically friction fires. They actually did end up, it took about a half an hour, 45 minutes of multiple people. It takes a village to make a fire, apparently. Um, several of the students had pretty good blisters on their hands from kind of rubbing these sticks together. It takes a lot of work. And even the guides were like, yeah, this is not the best way. Like, you should just travel with a lighter. But if you absolutely had to, right, this, was, this is a way that you can actually do this. Uh, so it was fun to, to kind of watch that go through and to see people get really excited, like, I want to try it. Look, I'm, can I be next, right? I, and everybody kind of pitching in and getting excited about doing this. Uh, we also did some testing of field skills. So part of what they had to do, uh, we called it the Rob Suave Olympics, which was named after a particularly uh, gregarious warthog that kind of wouldn't back down, wasn't the one that would run away. Um, and so essentially the students were taught how to use GPS, like traditional field GPS, not just kind of Google Maps, right? And these are no roads that are marked on GPS. So they were given a point. John, Jasmine, and I went out and hid little pieces of paper in things in the landscape. And then they had to learn how to drive this four-wheel drive vehicle and then drive themselves to each of the sites on their GPS. It was, and then we sat in the back and judged them. <laughs> and by judged, I mean laughed at them. Right, a lot of fun here. You can see they're basically searching through to find where everything is, so they kind of spread out 
and somebody with the GPS would kind of walk around and they'd try to find. By the end of it, most of the teams kind of got the idea like, oh, we should do this in a more organized fashion. Um, not every team did, but that's okay. Um, this is, I just thought this is great. This is Jasmine, who is one of John's uh, graduate students. So they were standing on rocks. Jasmine, I swear, is much bigger than this. But this picture made it look like she was a tiny little person dancing on top of the vehicle. But uh, Slow Rider was playing in the background. And somewhere I have a video that I couldn't find of John and Jasmine dancing to Slow Rider. Um, so you're lucky I, did, I couldn't find that one. <laughs> Um, here you can see, I'm not going to say John is evil uh, per se, but he seemed to get a lot of ch joy out of watching the students like circling things in the landscape and saying, what is this? And having the students go, you know, blank look on their face and then all of a sudden go, okay, I think I know what this is. So this was one of the field tests. We just walked along this road and randomly pointed out things to them that they were supposed to be paying attention to throughout the semester. And they actually did pretty well, right? Um, so it was, it was fun to watch them utilize some of the skills and some of the things that they were learning, right, as we went through. So at night, um, every night we'd eat meals together throughout the entire month. And there was something cool that we did that this was a tradition of John's, and I think it's really fantastic. Um, we did two things. First, we'd start off with, what's your favorite thing? Every night, we'd go around. And John made the guides do it and everybody. So it was really fun to listen to the guides who have been doing, some of them have been doing this for 20, 30 years. And to watch them light up and talk about their favorite thing at the end of every day. Initially, you know, you could kind of see people go, uh-huh, I don't want to do this. This sounds sort of cheesy and embarrassing. But by the end of it, people started out saying, my favorite thing was when we saw the cheetah take a nap, right? My favorite thing is when we saw the elephants. My favorite thing was this. I got really excited the first time somebody said, my favorite thing was measuring the baobabs. And I thought, I've reached one. Right? Um, by the end, though, we started hearing other things. My favorite thing was one where I got to sit down and chat with Okwa and talk about what was happening. My favorite thing is when I got to sit down and talk with Matt, and he told me about what it's like to live in South Africa. Right? My favorite thing was the interaction with people in these amazing landscapes, right? So it was more than just, oh, cool, more animals. Oh, cool, more trees, right? It was about the sort of feeling of this conservation and this whole thing. Um, the other thing we did is we'd read from a chapter of Aldo Leopold's Sand County Almanac. So each student was assigned a chapter and basically had to read aloud. And then John and I took our turns. And even a couple of the guides uh, got in on it and took a couple of turns reading through that book, because when you read it out loud, Leopold's words, right, they're really, it's kind of, you can feel it more than when you just read it on the page, right? It's very lyrical and poetic. So it was a great, uh, great experience for the students to sort of interact with the landscape in this particular way. Um, this is the whole group that went with, right? This is all of us. I didn't get all the guides in here, but you can see it was really a fun group. They became pretty close knit. When you travel with 18 students, there's always the possibility that there's going to be 18 problems, or at least 15 or something, right? Or at least a couple. We really didn't have any problems with this group. Uh, it was fantastic. Um, John and I, I think, had as much fun as the students had, if not more. Um, and it was really enjoyable to be with this group. And they were pretty cohesive, right? Um, and so it was, it was a great, great time for us to kind of hang out with these people. So if you have questions, this is what happens when you steal my camera and uh, take selfies, right? They end up in PowerPoint presentations that are recorded for all time. But if anybody has questions, I'm, I'm happy to, to answer questions or just chat in general about this. Um, and if you have questions you don't want to ask, you can always email me. Um, I'm happy to do that.